The throwing class in Terraria comprises of using a range of thrown weapons including explosives, daggers and all types of spiky objects. Throwers only have pre-hard mode equipment but what if we did something crazy and put it to the ultimate test? How's it going crew? This is Happy Days and today we're going to see how far you can get in Terraria using only the throwing class. Now before we get started we need to explain how this video is going to work. As the title of this video states we're going to see how far we can make it in Terraria using the throwing class which means I'll only use weapons with the throwing damage type. As an added challenge if we do indeed make it to hard mode I'm not allowed to use any hard mode armor for more survivability to make up for the lack of hard mode throwing armors. Any buffs can be used as long as they're available at the stage of the game I'm currently in. For example, life force potions can only be found in shadow chests pre-hard mode which makes them extremely limited before the wall of flesh. I've been making these challenge videos for well over a year now and I think this might be the first time we may not make it all the way to the Moon Lord so I'm adding a rule that this challenge is simply about pushing the throwing class as far as we can and I'm sure you enjoy watching me fail along the way. Lastly, I won't be using any major glitches to progress through the game or to defeat enemies without using throwing weapons. We are simply looking to see how far we can get in Terraria with the throwing class. With that said, let's get this crazy challenge started. We spawn into a new world and like most new characters in the world of Terraria, we start by tearing down the nearby forest. I can't craft any throwing starter weapons, so I'll settle on a wooden broadsword for now. I also quickly build some houses as the demolitionist and merchant NBCs will be useful as they sell shuriken and grenades respectively. The merchant even sells throwing knives during a blood moon which can even be upgraded for even more damage. We've also spawned right next to a snow biome which is fantastic because I'll need lots of snow. Snowballs can be crafted from snow and inflict throwing damage. While I'm here I also upgrade to boreal wooden armor as we're about to start exploring. Heading underground, I have a few immediate goals. I'm looking for life crystals to max my health as soon as possible, lots of accessories for reforging and materials for a grappling hook. I make sure to smash lots of pots as they have a chance to drop shuriken to help against groups of enemies. I discover a marble biome which gives me a great area to farm for hoplites. Hoplites have a 50% chance to drop javelins, a powerful thrown weapon which has a piercing ability and long range. These will be a great weapon until I can craft bone javelins later on. If you're wondering, I'm playing on a medium world in normal mode. I've gone with a slightly bigger world size as I'll need tons of a certain material that you'll see soon enough. Getting to max health takes a while, but I'm having fun exploring, collecting lots of loot and materials. Finally, with my health maxed out and a full inventory, I return to base to begin the quest for some powerful equipment. Back at base, I purchase two pigs from the merchant, one for me and one for our base. I also stock up on shuriken before visiting the demolitionist and stocking up on bombs and grenades. Our first target is the Eater of Worlds, so after grabbing some potions, I head to the Corruption for our first boss battle. After I attach a sticky bomb to the last shadow orb in the Corruption, I quickly climb up to a special arena I had prepared just earlier. The Eater of World tends to climb on objects, so I've made a vertical line of platforms leading up to my battle platform. Checking my minimap, I can see when it's approaching and drop grenades on its head dealing critical damage. After each of its heads is destroyed, it keeps attempting to climb up to me, allowing me to chain grenades into the boss from relative safety. It takes a few cycles, but eventually the boss is defeated and we get one step closer to our first major upgrades. I craft a nightmare pickaxe and immediately head to the underground desert biome. I can now mine up desert fossils and I'll need plenty as these fossils allow me to craft some of the strongest throwing equipment in the game. I do realize I could have fished up the reaver shark to skip the eater of worlds battle but fighting the boss is way faster and it was good practice for some of the tougher boss battles I'll be facing soon enough. It takes a while but I do farm up tons of fossils and I managed to find an extractinator along the way so with an inventory full of loot it's time to move on with our challenge. Back at base I start to feed desert fossils through the extractinator. We're mostly after sturdy fossils but all the other ores and gems will be a fantastic source of cash for our reforging costs moving forward. Once I have lots of sturdy fossils I craft a set of fossil armor to boost our throwing powers as well as plenty of bone throwing knives and bone javelins. With all of our powered up equipment we head to the jungle to collect our next weapon. After setting up a spawn point I smash the lava and summon the queen bee to test out our new bone weapons. The javelins can stick to enemies dealing up to an extra 18 damage per second and the bone knives fire rapidly and have a piercing effect which is perfect for dealing with the small bees that get summoned during the battle. 
The fight doesn't last long and soon enough the bee falls. The main items I want are the bee nades and the bee wax. You can use the bee wax to craft even more bee nades, so I'll have a massive supply of them in no time. Next we head to the dungeon to challenge Skeletron. Our bee nades deal massive damage to the hands and head while I throw javelins, knives and grenades when I can. Once the hands are down, I keep the pressure up and once the skull starts spinning, I lob a few grenades to finish it off. With Skeletron defeated, it's time to raid the dungeon. There's a few things I wouldn't mind collecting in the dungeon. Firstly, the bones that drop from most of the enemies are yet another throwing weapon, so I make sure to grab as many as I can. I find the mechanic too, which is awesome, as I may need a wrench and some wire if we make it to hard mode to help build some arenas and farms for the tougher bosses. A cobalt shield will be useful, as our defense score will be extremely low during this challenge, so I can't afford to get stunlocked by enemies, or it will be certain doom for our character. Back at base, a blood moon has risen, which means it's time to visit the merchant to purchase several stacks of throwing knives. They can be upgraded to poison knives, which enables me to poison enemies, so these will surely be useful. As usual, I farm for a shark tooth necklace from the blood zombies in Dripplers. It takes most of the night, but eventually the necklace drops and our thrower gains even more power. I can't rest just yet, however, because when the morning comes, I get the announcement a goblin army is about to invade. While I'm battling the goblins, they drop spiky balls, which is even another throwing weapon to add to our collection. Once the goblins are defeated, I start digging a halivator to make our way to the underworld. Making a quick way to traverse the underground will be critical in hard mode as enemies start to far outpower our equipment. Whilst underground, my hunter potion shows the bound goblin and he's under attack by enemies. I quickly mind my way to rescue him and thankfully he survives. I purchase the usual rocket boots and Tinkerer's workshop off of him and continue to the underworld. Using a water walking potion and my shadow key, I do some looting of the ruined houses in the underworld. There's no weapons I need from shadow chests but they can contain some nice potions so I make sure to grab all of them. After a bit of looting I make my way back to the surface as there's still even more weapons I need to get my hands on. I take the time to build a special house for the tavern keep because he was complaining he was cold. I purchase a few stacks of ale from him before letting him have a hot bath. The tavern keep drops a throwing weapon called the ale tosser when killed which uses ale as ammunition and is one of the only throwing weapons that can actually be reforged for even more damage. After paying my respects to the brave tavern keep, I stop by the corruption to fish up some even koi. These are needed to craft wrath potions which will give me another 10% boost to my damage which will definitely be needed if we make it to hard mode. Returning to base, I craft some molotov cocktails using the ale I purchased before and upgrade my throwing knives to poison knives as well as restocking my other thrown weapons. I upgrade my accessories and then visit the goblin for a power boost by reforging them all to menacing to further increase our throwing power. Fully stocked and ready for battle, it's time to fight the wall of flesh. There was tons of power-ups available in this first stage of our challenge and here's what I managed to achieve in pre-hard mode with the throwing class before fighting the wall of flesh. We have the bone throwing knives and javelins, an unreal ale tosser, bee nades and molotov cocktails. We crafted a full set of fossil armor which gives us an extra 20% damage and throwing speed as well as 15% critical strike and a 50% chance not to consume throwing weapons. Our main accessory is our shark tooth necklace but we also got some nice mobility items all reforged to menacing for a 20% bonus to our damage. For honorable mentions I'd just like to note I skipped the ninja armor as the fossil armor is better and they're available so closely together it wasn't worth my time farming for it in my opinion but if you want to farm for it first it's totally up to you after making a runway in the underworld i get my buffs on and summon the wall of flesh my bee nades and molotov cocktails absolutely decimate the hungries in near seconds leaving the wall wide open for my other weapons i stick several javelins into all the wall segments while rotating through my other weapons and apply new bee nades as they wear off grenades deal massive damage and help wear down the wall and soon enough it explodes as hard mode begins there are a few upgrades available to us in hard mode but most of them are locked behind bosses which is going to make this really tough i start by stopping by the jungle to quickly pick up a set of leaf wings from the witch doctor next i do a bit of fishing in the hello for some prismite this will allow me to craft life force potions which boost our hp by a whopping 80 points because we're at 400 health this will be valuable against the mechs bosses we'll be fighting very soon there's an upgrade available in the solar eclipse, but I need to defeat a mech boss before it can spawn naturally. I decide to challenge the destroyer first, and my first attempt is to create a safety box with lots of regen to hopefully keep me safe during the battle. After crafting several gold crowns, I head to the corruption and turn them into slime crowns. You might be wondering why I'd want to fight King Slime at this stage, but I've got a nice trick to show you. I head to the underworld and make two tiny arenas just where the corruption and hello biomes appear. I then summon the King Slime, and as I kill all the little slimies, they drop souls of light and night 
fight due to being near the corruption and hello biomes. This saves me the hassle of having to fight the difficult hard mode mobs while still getting the souls of light and night I need to craft the mech boss summon items. As a little bonus, I even collect a set of ninja armor to display in my base. The last thing I need before the mech bosses is to craft a hard mode anvil. I open the crates I collected while fishing and get the ore I need. All that's left is to craft the destroyer summon and wait for night time for our first big hard mode boss battle. Later that night, I get my buffs on and summon the destroyer. The strategy here is to rain down grenades and other high damage weapons from up high, while the safety box protects me from most of the probes laser fire. B nades help a lot to deal with the probes and I make sure to keep dipping in the honey for extra regen. I honestly thought that regular grenades would deal most of the damage to the destroyer, but our B nades managed to dish out decent damage to lots of the destroyer's segments at once. Once the probe stops spawning as much, I realize it's just a damage race to the finish. I can't believe it as I get close to the massive worm just before it explodes and we've officially beaten our first mech boss. That said, the same strategy won't work on the other two mech bosses so it's time to power up. A few mornings later, a solar eclipse begins and I get ready to farm for vampires. Vampires drop the moonstone accessory which gives some nice bonuses at night including 10% damage, some critical strike, regen and defense. In all of the madness, I see the Moonstone item name flash on screen and I check my inventory to confirm we've managed to find our prize. With the Moonstone acquired, it's time to prepare for the Twins and Skeletron Prime. The next morning, I set up a quick gel farm using the slime statue I found earlier and buy a blender matic from the Steampunker. I'm going to try and use a long asphalt runway for the next boss battles, which will hopefully keep me from taking too much damage. I'll take the time to make it extra long so I don't have to mess around changing direction too much during the battle. A few nights later, I'm ready to summon the Twins. I've zoomed out for this battle to help keep track of where those evil eyeballs are during this fight. Spasmatism chases faster than Retinazer, so I really I really only have to deal with him at the start of the fight if I keep running. I keep alternating between filling it full of javelins and lobbing b nades and grenades at it when it charges at me. Its second form is basically the same as the first and I'm careful to avoid the cursed flamethrower to keep my health topped up. Once spasmatism falls, Retinazer moves in and I'll need to adjust my strategy. Retinazer still chases me but tends to hover higher in the air so normal grenades are a lot less effective. I try to land B-nades when I can, but bone javelins are doing most of the damage here. Once it gets to its second form, the laser spam becomes really dangerous due to my low health, but I have to take a few risks to keep the damage up so I can defeat it by morning. Eventually, Retinazer finally falls and I move in to collect the Souls of Sight and prepare for the Skeletron Prime Showdown. My guess is that B-nades will be really useful against Skeletron Prime's arms, so I spend the next day farming Queen Bee for more B-nades and B-wax, whilst also stocking up on more buff potions ahead of the battle. That night, I zoom back out and summon Skeleton Prime. I immediately start bombarding it with B nades and javelins as I won't be able to do much with Prime's four arms attacking me relentlessly. That said, I'm noticing Prime's skull takes barely any damage from the B nades when it uses its spin attacks, but the Prime saw keeps blocking my javelins and grenades, so I start to focus on that when I can. Once the saw is destroyed, I have more freedom to try different attacks and notice grenades work well during its spin attack, whilst bone knives are fast enough to track the skull while it's flying around. Suddenly, I notice that the moon is already more than halfway through the sky, meaning I'm rapidly running out of time before Prime uses its instant kill ability when the morning comes. Prime is under a thousand health just as the moon is about to set and as I launch a last ditch attack to take it out just in time. I can't believe how close the fight was as I collect the souls and prepare for Plantera and Golem. Life Root has been slowly growing in the jungle while I was battling the mech bosses so I take a quick detour to collect plenty of them. I have to move fast because the enemies deal massive damage to me as my defense score is so low but soon enough we have all the fruit we need. Back at base, I take my new souls and craft a pickaxe axe and then upgrade the sorcerer emblem we got earlier to an avenger emblem for an extra 12% damage. After I restock my supplies, I head to the jungle to prepare for our Plantera battle. I find a bulb and get to work blowing up an arena around it with sticky dynamite. I'll do the usual trick of making a tall arena so the spiky balls fall down and don't damage me during the battle. Much later, the arena is ready and I smash the bulb to summon Plantera. Thanks to my arena, all I need to do in the first phase is fly circles around her using bone knives and javelins with grenades mixed in to boost the damage. It's pretty slow going due to Plantera's high defense, but as long as I keep moving, I take minimal damage during this phase. As soon as Plantera goes second form, I start throwing molotovs and b-nades like crazy as I rapidly deal with the tentacles she spawns. I play it safe until all the summons are defeated and then like the first form, I just fly circles around her until Plantera is finally defeated. 
Our next upgrades require Golem to be defeated, so I make my way straight for the temple. It takes a while to find, however, because it's partly buried, but eventually I find the entrance. I quickly make my way through the temple, looting chests as I go. Enemies are becoming quite strong, so things like calming potions and peace candles are becoming useful in keeping spawn rates more manageable. Thankfully, the Golem chamber is quite large, and I start to prepare it for the upcoming battle. A strategy I want to try against Golem is one I call the Endless Runway. The way this works is by putting one teleporter either end of the Golem chamber and having having them loop back on each other via a pressure plate. This way you can run at full speed in an endless loop which makes it much harder for Golem to hit you. When everything's ready I use a power cell and start the battle. I get up to the platform and swap in my obsidian shield accessory. Knockback will get me killed in this fight and I don't really need to fly once I'm on the runway. I focus on the head as much as possible as the Golem fists only punch faster and faster the more they get damaged. I don't have to run much early on but as I get closer to destroying the head it fires lasers at me forcing me to start moving. Once Golem goes second form I now try to focus only on the body as as the fists are getting really damaged and are starting to hurt me with their rapid punches. Just as our health is getting dangerously low, Golem finally blows up and we can catch our breath. The cultists are unlocked now, but I really need the Sunstone and Eye of Golem for upgrades before moving on, so I fight another Golem. A few minutes later, another Golem falls and it drops the Eye of Golem, so I decide to sidetrack for some power boost before I continue farming. If I'm going to attempt the endgame, I'll need to grab every power boost I possibly can get, so my first mission is to fight another Wall of Flesh for an extra emblem accessory. Thankfully, the first wall I fight drops the Summoner emblem, which saves me heaps of time waiting around for a new guide NPC to spawn. Back at base, I upgrade my Avenger Emblem to a Destroyer Emblem which gives me 10% damage and 8% critical strike and then make her another Avenger Emblem to replace my old one. Next I'll need to farm more Golems until I get two Sunstones. These will be used to make the Celestial Stone and Celestial Shell to give us a much needed boost to our damage output. After making some alterations to my Solar Eclipse Arena, I use a Solar Tablet and start the event. Now that Plantera is defeated, I have to face all of the Solar Eclipse mods, including Mothron. That said, the pit I added to the arena helps keep most of the mobs out of my way while I focus on vampires and soon we pick up a few more moonstones. The last item I need is a moon charm which is a fairly rare drop from the werewolves during a full moon. I use my mech boss runway to quickly and easily spawn lots of werewolves and after the chaos of the eclipse it's quite relaxing farming the mobs as they come to get me. Back at base I craft two celestial stones and combine the moon charm and neptune shell into a moon shell. I then combine one of the celestial stones with the moon shell to make the celestial shell. I can now equip both of these accessories for a whopping 20% extra damage, some critical strike, 8 defense and some health regen. I honestly can't believe the throwing class has made it this far as I attack the cultists and begin the end game. That said, the enemies from here on out are extremely tough and we may not make it much further. I lead the lunatic cultists to a small arena I set up before the battle. I read on the wiki that similar to the moon lord some of the cultists attacks can't go through blocks so I placed some blocks in the air to help stop some of the damage. The next challenge to overcome was how to damage the cultists if I'm hiding behind a barrier for most of the fight. I noticed the explosion radius of grenades goes through blocks so I crafted sticky grenades that I could attach to my barrier that would damage the cultists on the other side for decent damage. Halfway through the fight the cultist starts to use the ancient light attack that deals massive damage and is hard to avoid with my current equipment. The only solution is to use honey when I can risk it and focus on dealing damage as fast as possible. After a really stressful battle, the cultist finally falls and I collect the ancient manipulator whilst a stardust zone spawns right near me. I back off to catch my breath quickly and rearrange my accessories and weapons. I set up a spawn point right near the outskirts of the nebula pillar zone and step inside just long enough to spawn a few mobs before falling back to safety. These mobs are not only fast, but they deal big damage and have high health, so I can only manage a few of them at a time if I want to stay alive. My beanades and bone javelins deal nice damage, and I use some grenades and bone knives when I can manage it. It's really slow going, but unlike a boss fight, I can stop and heal every few mobs, and even go and restock my weapons and potions when needed, so beating these pillars is mostly just a matter of time. A while later, the nebula shield falls, and I start YOLOing it, throwing everything I can at it. I die several times in the process, but our first pillar finally falls, and it's time to restock and move on to the next one. I do the same process with the Vortex and Solar Pillars. It literally takes forever because I can only fight a few mobs at a time, but if I take it nice and slow, I don't die as much. Before I tackle the fourth pillar, I'll go and restock supplies at base. After topping up my equipment, I head to the Stardust Pillar. The pillar itself is spawned on top of my asphalt runway, which makes fighting it a little easier due to the even surface. 
Once a pillar is destroyed, I collect the fragments and quickly return to the Moon Lord Arena to get ready for battle. And the Moon Lord completely destroys me. It's not even close, guys. I get utterly and brutally wiped off the face of Terraria as the Moon Lord mocks my little throwing class roller coaster strategy. I even try to equip my wings during the fight and try to fly around the Phantasmal Death Ray, but the damage from the other attacks is so extreme I get quickly defeated. So is this how far the throwing class can get in Terraria? This pre-hard mode class can make it all the way up to the Moon Lord battle, but fall short at the final hurdle? I looked at different arenas and item combinations, including seeing if any Crimson World items could help. I also researched the wiki for answers, and I think I might have found a strategy that works. For my loadout, I'm wearing the Fossil Armor with the Celestial Shell and Stone, the Avenger and Destroyer Emblems, and the Sun and Moon Stones, all with menacing modifiers. We'll need the Nurse and Dryad NPCs as well as plenty of grenades and Bone Javelins with Icor Flasks as well as our usual buff potions. Okay, so let's look at how this battle works. You start by grappling the ground, damaging the eyes equally so you don't spawn any true eyes of Cthulhu too early on. Cure your health with the Nurse when your HP gets low. The Nurse can also cure the Moonbite debuff which stops the Moon Lord healing itself every 40 seconds for 3000 hit points. Once the core is open, you continue the same strategy except you need to cure the Moonbite debuff every 10 seconds now which means switching between damage and healing very quickly. Because of my low damage, the fight lasts well over an hour, and I think Terraria started to bug out because, as you can see, the true eyes of Cthulhu actually disappeared. I'm guessing Terraria has reached some NPC or enemy sprite limit, which I definitely want to research later after this video. Disaster strikes when my grapple unhooks, and because it's nighttime and the nurse is not in a proper house, she moves back to my main base and the Moon Lord actually starts to heal itself. It can't actually attack me however, so all I need to do is reposition back at base and start the long process of fighting the core again. Another 20 minutes later, my hands are trembling as the core is almost destroyed. Once the core hits zero, the Moon Lord starts blowing up to my utter amazement. We've managed to beat Terraria using the throwing class, which is something I never thought possible. This was so much fun, challenging myself to see how far I could get in Terraria using throwing weapons, and if you'd like to see me attempt this challenge again using another crazy weapon or item, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button and consider subscribing for more fun videos like this. And here's the most important part as always, you'll stay happy and I'll see you soon. This is Happy Days signing out. See ya!